<laughs> Good morning. On this windy spring day, I'd like to um, welcome Rebecca Kajander, who's actually um, my sister-in-law, who's going to uh, talk to us about calm strategies for this crazy world, which we certainly have. So, Becky. Good morning. Gosh, you know, here I was thinking we would just have this really nice, small, intimate group, and I forgot about the, the video part. So good morning to anyone who might be watching as well. Um, I, I am happy to be here. I, I was, uh, I've, I've spent my whole career as a pediatric nurse practitioner working with kids who really struggled with developmental and behavioral and mental health issues. And so it has been sort of a pas passion of mine um, for a long, long time. I had hoped, actually, to begin my presentation with a video. However, despite how much I looked and looked and looked, the vi I think it is no longer available anywhere. So I'm going to invite all of you to use that video in your imagination for just a moment. And in any way that it comes to you, I invite you to imagine a really lush green pasture in the savanna of Africa. And in that pasture, oh, I don't know, perhaps there is a one zebra, perhaps it's a family of zebras, and they are all just very calmly nibbling on the grass, finding the sweetest part, very calmly having a wonderful time. And all of a sudden, into their awareness, it might be visual, it might be auditory, I don't know, zebras, it could be some other sensation. They become a And the lion is coming at them faster and faster and faster to the point where the zebra kicks in, goes flying away from their favorite grazing spot. Their heart is pounding. Their breathing is hard. Their muscles are... are Tense and going full force because it's a life or death situation for them, isn't it? So they do that, and this time they're lucky. They outpace the, Z the lion, and they are aware almost instantly when the lion runs the other direction. And within minutes, the zebra and their pals are very calmly and quietly once again grazing in the pasture. Their heart rate has come down, their muscles are relaxed, their breathing is normal. Hmm. Why don't zebras get ulcers? Is the name of a book um, by Robert Sapolsky. He is a, a professor of neurology at San Francisco State University, I believe, and he's done a lot of work on the stress in the human body and what happens with all of us. So you can easily find it on YouTube. He also has a great lecture, by the way, that's very in entertaining. So if you use YouTube, I, I encourage you to look at that. But the question really to bring to our mind is how are we different? How does our nervous system, because we have all the same parts, right? How is our nervous system different than that of the zebras? 
Any ideas? We don't shut down. That's exactly, exactly right. And of course, we don't shut down because we have all of this developed brain power that keeps us up at night sometimes, right? Yeah. So um, that's the process that I am going to be talking about. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to suggest or ask maybe if you can just put your cups down for a minute. And I don't know what you all had to do to get here this morning or to get on the camera this morning. I don't know how you slept last night. I don't know if you were busy this morning. I don't know if you have a lot of plans for the day. But just for a moment, please put your feet on the floor. Put your hands together like this. Take a deep breath in, breathe in. As you lift your hands up above your head, however far that goes this morning, and then just go, ah. Oh. Let's do it one more time. Bring your hands together, breathe in. Ah. Oh. And then feel your feet on the floor. Maybe even move them a little bit. Feel your body in the chair. Feel perhaps your back is around the back of the chair. And perhaps that will help you just a little bit to be right here, right now, for the next however minutes that, that we are together. So our brains never shut down. I sat down in a very short period of time, by the way, and made a list of the stress on steroids that human beings have been suffering from or involved in in the last couple of years. You know it all. Maybe it, it stresses you even to look at the word COVID, what's happening in our media, the war, climate change, violence, and the political divide in our country. You can't pick up a newspaper. I no longer want to send the week magazine that my son and his, and his wife read because it has really graphic pictures on the front of it. And I have a nine and 11 year old grands, grandkids and I wanna protect them a little bit. So, um, and I also just put just a couple of facts down here. More than 140,000 children have lost a parent or a caregiver. Think how that's going to impact their nervous system for the rest of their lives. 44% of children, of teenagers, uh, expressed feeling sad, isolated, or depressed. That was in uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics, by the way. The drug overdose by death is the highest that it has ever, ever, ever been in history, um, and in our young people, those who are 25 to 44 years of age had the greatest increase in alcohol deaths. So we know that everything that's been going on has been huge and major. And I don't know about you, but I think sometimes we just have to turn it off, right? Go out and smell the flowers or something. So there's all that big stuff going on. Ray, will you help me? Or Carolyn? Oh, I got it. I got it. Thanks. Thanks for your help, Ray. OK, so those are the big stressors. But we have lots of little things that kick up our nervous system many different times in the day. They may be really good, fun, exciting things that we're looking forward to, right? They may be something that happens in our, in our lives that we don't expect and, and we feel so grateful. So what are a few of the everyday kinds of stressors that you're aware of that change the reaction of your nervous system? I wrote out, I'll get you started, I wrote up 
I can't find my glasses. Oops, they're on the top of my head, right? Or where is that darn phone? Did I leave it in this purse or that purse, you know, whatever? Or my car keys? Or exposure fears? Or mass confusion these days? Mask, M-A-S-K, not mass, right? Or, or the amount of traffic that's going on in, in our town. I was telling Ray and Carolyn yesterday I had to drive in a rainstorm <clears throat> on 94 um, uh, to get to the hospital, United Hospital, and it was pouring and it was thundering and I don't like to drive in the rain. I was sitting there like this. You know, I was gripping the steering wheel and as my husband would say, you're driving like an old lady. I say, okay, fine. <laughs> but all of a sudden I thought, I have to breathe here. You know, I was just hanging on. So what are some of the small little things that change your nervous system? Yes. Uh, yes. Change in a routine, change in a schedule. Yeah, right. What else? Yeah. <laughs> Taxes, getting ready. I don't know. We have to pay something this year. And I said, Jerry, how, how come we have to pay? We're retired. You know, can't we just, don't we just give them enough money? Anybody else? Oh, Ray, you're so, yes, we don't want them, right? And then sometimes we can say, oh, God, it's just, you know, that old knee that's bugging me. But then we say, well, I wonder if I need to do something about that. Or every time we get a cough, think, oh, I better get out that COVID test, right? All these things that can change it just just kick it up just a little bit. Now, <clears throat> as I said a minute ago, just like the zebras, we all have the same parts in our nervous system. We have the same parts in our body. But we can react to these little and those big stressors in many different ways, right? So just for a moment, spread out here, I'm going to have you talk to one another that wasn't your spouse. But just for a moment, think about how when suddenly there's a change in your schedule, or that ache and a pain is beginning to worry you or bother you, or you get excited about something, how does your nervous system tend to react? Your body gets tight. Yeah. Anybody anything different? Isn't that smart? Of course, I hope you're not on a schedule. That could be difficult. <laughs> okay. Oh, you, yeah, you carry the weight of the world on your shoulders? Yeah, don't we all? Don't we all? Yeah. I always have... I get a GI reaction every time I have, that something is startling to me. So, anybody else? <clears throat> we have um, great language. I love to talk about the language. We have great language to talk about our nervous system. And stress, whether it's good or bad, can hijack every single system of our body. So what do we say about our breath? If we get scared, startled, nervous, excited, what do we say about our breath? We hold it. <gasps> okay, I'm going to give you this one, but I'm going to push it. Um, yeah, <gasps> oh, it just took my breath away, right? What do we say about our heart? My heart was, hmm? Yeah, yeah, skipped a beat, right? My heart was pounding, racing, it just skipped a beat. 
Carolyn, you talked about your muscles getting tight. What do we say about the muscles of our body? I was frozen in my tracks. I couldn't move, right? What do we say about the digestive system? I've got butterflies in my stomach. That's what happens to me, I think. Or it's gut-wrenching, right? What happens to, um, oh, let's see, what else? What happens to, uh, hmm, what happens to how much we, we sweat and perspire? Oh, I was sweating like a pig, or, you know? We have all these phrases. Now, I will tell you that I work for teenagers. Um, and, and they don't necessarily use this same language. In fact, I was talking to my not yet teenager, but 11-year-old granddaughter the other day. She said, oh, Grandma, this was just epic. I had to think, oh, yeah, the big deal, right? <laughs> OK. So um, today we're going to talk about how we can mitigate some of these reactions to our nervous system, some ways that we can calm them. And Carolyn originally said that the topic was how can we help our kids or how can we help our grandkids with some of those, all these stressors in their world. And it didn't, I, pretty quickly, it came to me that I don't, you can't teach something that you don't know. So I decided it was more important to share with you things that you can do by yourself that you can then share with others. So that's sort of going to be my um, goal for today. All right. There is, I would like that video, please. There is a man. Um, he is the a professor of psychiatry at, I don't know, UCLA or something. But he's done really, really good work, not only with the stress response in um, people, but he also does a lot of his work helping um, teachers, therapists, et cetera, work with kids. And he has this great model of the brain. Now, this is an old video, one of the, he's quite a bit older now. But I liked it because he's speaking it in his very own voice. And um, yeah, we're not going to do this. We're not going to do this eight minute one. <laughs> Let's just do this one. So this is Dan Siegel talking about the three part brain.
Emotions are rising up to the brain stem and the area here, and how it's overriding the prefrontal area and making so they may be about to flip their legs. So I had kids come to tell me that they are about to go flip their legs and they need a break. They need a time out. And by even just naming that, they can see it. That's the power of using a hand model for ourselves and our children to help us all make sense of what goes on. Emotional communication that we have in the course of day to day life. Okay. Oh, I like that. Is that laughter? I like that. <laughs> I have watched this video numerous times. I've taught it numerous times. Let's go through it one more time. It's, he calls it the three-part brain. This, my forearm, is the spinal cord, right? This part right here is called the reptilian brain. It's where our basic life functions occur, breathing, heart rate, for example. It connects with a gazillion, million, billion neurons into this center part that's called the mammalian brain, a little higher order, right? And in this part is um, our memory and our learning and our emotions. And that's important to have because, oh, by the way, how old were you when you learned if you touch the hot stove, you're going to get burned? M learning and memory and emotions, right? Okay? Then these, all these functions connect with the upper part of our brain. Your thumb is actually your emotions. Okay, so this is the upper part of the brain. This part here on the top is how we sense the outer world. Um, our, our senses, hearing, seeing, think, feeling, touch and taste. Um, our, our awareness of what's going on, our mobility, all of those things are in this, this part of the brain up here. And this, your fingernails is what's called the prefrontal cortex. This is where um, our, our, our thinking occurs, but it's where uh, our executive functions occur, which is planning schedules, organizing. Oh, geez, what all do I have to have today, right? Planning, organizing, sequencing, making decisions all occurs up here. And when it's all in balance, wow, you're having a good day, right? But then, I don't know, your schedule's changed, somebody zips around you when you're in the car, you worry about something, you get excited about something, and it literally, it hits your um, brainstem, kicks up that stress response, and in, in essence, all of the neurons have to go down here to take care of this and not up here. Now, of course, we need that. It saves our lives from time to time, doesn't it? Right? We need, we have to have that. And as human beings, we are, we are um, made to protect ourselves, to figure out what's dangerous or what's not dangerous. So we have to have that working well. But it doesn't allow the same kind of neuron connection to go up to this upper part of our brain. Now, how in the heck do you suppose you get it back down? How does that happen? Guess what? Well, first of all, you have to become aware. Oh, I'm holding my breath. I'm driving. I'm, right? We have to be aware. It happens when we change our breath intentionally. It helps 
once we start to connect, once again, we can say, oh yeah, it's not such a big deal. I drive a Subaru car, I will be fine in the rain, for example, right? Or, oh gosh, yeah, I didn't turn off the stove, but nothing bad happened, so it's all okay. Kind of talk to ourselves, right? And then those neurons start to connect once again, and pretty soon, we're okay. Again, you can get to that video if you would like to. Um, I could have done this whole entire presentation just by talking about breathing, because I've done it, because I believe, and when I used to give talks about this stuff, I would say, you know what? If the good Lord said, you can see this person one time, and you can teach them one thing, that's all. I would teach them how to breathe. And I had the great pleasure and honor um, when I was in practice and the, the pediatric residents would come into the clinic where I was working. And at that time, I was doing a lot of biofeedback work with kids, um, and it was, it was just so fun. All those things that we talked about, you know, your breathing, your heart rate, your skin temperature, all those things we talked about, um, we can measure with kids. We can put a belt around their waist and it stretches when they breathe or it doesn't stretch when they don't breathe. We can put a little gizmo on their finger and it can pick up their heartbeat. We can do another one that measures how sweaty or dry their skin is. Um, and they can see it on the computer screen. And you know when you can see it and you can feel it, you can change it, right? Right? So there were many, many pediatric residents in their practice, going to be pediatricians, that I had to teach how to breathe with their diaphragm. So this is one of the things that um, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll take a little segue here. Uh, I have retired from clinical practice after 45 years of taking care of kids, which I loved every single day. Um, but I wasn't quite done with my passion. And so now I go to um, Masonic Children's Hospital over on Riverside or United Hospital in St. Paul. And I go into the mental health units there and I, work, and I teach mind-body skills to those people who are hospitalized uh, inpatient. Some, they range from kids 8 to 12, adolescents 12 to 18, young adults 20 to whatever the other limit is, and geriatrics. Um, and it, it has been, it, it, it has been just, just an honor for me to be able to go in and, and work with those people. Um, the program that I work with is called Move Mindfully. It was started by a woman who was a social worker in the Minneapolis School District. And she would have kids that would come in and she was supposed to work with them. But oh man, you know, they were uptight and they were yelling and they were hollering and whatever it was that was upsetting them. And she finally said, we're done talking here. We're done talking. We're gonna do some yoga. We're gonna move our bodies. We're gonna get back into being able to think with our brains and not be in such a survival mode, right? She, had, we, she, we have taken that program to more than 46 school districts in the state of Minnesota, 11 states in the country so far, and also into uh, two hospitals, uh, one juvenile detention center, and we're working with other care centers now. Um, and, and, and our goal is really to take the science of what happens with, and combine it with mindfulness and meditation to bring more healthy um, strategies and environments into not only schools, but um, healthcare centers as well. So that's really our goal. One of the things we use is this thing called a breathing ball. And we know that it takes somewhere between five to 10 
nice slow breaths, whatever that is for you, to help calm down that nervous system. So uh, how many breaths do you think we should take today? Somewhere between five and 10 to calm or to maybe energize your nervous system, whatever it is that needs to happen. Five, okay. So um, could I ask you to come up here and help me with that, please? All right, so here's what you're gonna do. You said we need five breaths, all right? All right, so I'm gonna have you hold this actually. And when you breathe in, you're gonna pull this apart like this. And when you breathe out, okay, all right. And Carolyn, would you, after he's done with one round of breath in and out, would you please say the number one and count for him? All right, are you ready? Can everybody see? Okay, are you ready? Breathe in and breathe out. One. Breathe in and breathe out. Ah. Breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in and breathe out. Four. Thank you, Ray. All right. Anybody want to say what they noticed while they were doing that breathing? First and foremost, did you notice that you were breathing? <laughs> yeah, you did it with him, right? So this is called a breathing ball, um, and we can just we can just toss it to one of the kids and have them breathe with us and and get them involved in that way. It's a very nice visual, isn't it? Yes. And talking about visuals, I'll just show you this other one. Now my poor ball has kind of collapsed here, but it works the same way. So do you ever have those moments or those days when you just got way too much on your mind and, and too many thoughts are jumbled up or maybe you can't just get them just as clear, your mind isn't thinking as clearly as you want it to? Well, take a moment, find your breath, relax your body, and let it calm. So that's another visual that we'll use. Okay. Um, just for a moment, just take one hand and put it on a shoulder. Take another hand and put it on your other shoulder. If that doesn't fit, you put your hands right here on, on your arms. Take in a breath and just sway yourself back and forth in the chair a little bit. You might again feel your feet on the floor, feel your back against the back of the chair, across all your the legs, yeah. All right, now take a breath in, and then just gently let yourself roll down. Maybe your hands will come to your knees. Maybe they'll go below your knees, I don't know. Some of you might touch the floor. You might even just sway here a little bit. And then slowly, slowly round your back and lift yourself back up. Sometimes it's nice just to connect our brains and our bodies and, and do a little moving, right? And, and a little stretching. Okay. Uh, I'm going to spend this time actually giving you, uh, how are we doing with time? Can I just peek here? Okay. Okay. Um, so we're going to spend a little time here on just some of the different kinds of breathing strategies that you can use that you can then teach whomever you want to teach. And for this part, I would like it if you could stand up.
Or if that's uncomfortable, you could sit down. Okay. And just for a moment, just round your shoulders and kind of slump. I don't know, maybe you think about something that you don't want to do, that you have to do, or maybe, I don't know, you're just feeling like this because we haven't seen the sunshine for a million years now. And notice if it changes your ability to take that nice deep breath. Stand up. Roll your shoulders back. Think of something that you really enjoy. A person, a place, a thing. My brother is probably fishing. I don't know. Round your shoulders. Take in a nice breath. Breathe in. Take in all those things that make you feel good and just go, ah. Oh. Go ahead and sit down. Was your breathing different the first time than the second time? Yeah? How was your breathing different? Yes, yes. You, not only, yes, not only could you breathe, but you felt relief. Yes, yes. Anything else? Anybody else? I couldn't you couldn't do it. And you can't do it because you have collapsed your diaphragm, which is the breathing muscle. And you just can't do it. OK. <laughs> what am I talking about? I'm talking about posture. And even our posture can affect how we breathe. And how often are we on our iPads or our iPhones or our computers or whatever it is that we do, right? So that's a tip that you can have. Just remember your posture. And if you have to lean down to do it, that's fine. But just take some time to, to sit up straight. And as, however it works in your body, just roll your shoulders back. It'll help you breathe. <clears throat> um, we have a, a, a breathing muscle called the diaphragm. It's right here underneath our rib cage. When we use it to breathe with, it moves out when we breathe in and comes back when we exhale. But a lot of people don't do that or don't know how to breathe using their diaphragm on purpose. Here's a way that you can do it pretty naturally. Take any old kind of breath you want through your nose. And then I want you to imagine that you're exhaling. This is a straw. <laughs> that you're exhaling through a straw. Take one hand and just put it right here. Take that breath in, breathe in. And now breathe in until you feel your belly tighten just a little bit, which means you've kicked out all that air. Take any old kind of breath in that feels good to you. Breathe in. Blow out through that straw. Can you feel your abdominal muscles getting tight just a bit? Yeah. So that means that that diaphragm is pushing up, and you're really using your diaphragm to breathe with. Another way that I do it with the kids, by the way, is I just have them take their hands and put their middle fingers together like this. Just like this, all right? Now, when I, when I breathe in, watch what happens to these fingers, these, my fingers. Breathe in. Do you feel your fingers coming apart just a little bit? And breathe out. Or what happens when you take a great big breath and you're up in your shoulders because you've got to run fast or you've got, got to get away, watch what happens. <gasps> we, we collapse our diaphragm. So, okay. 
So we've talked a little bit about breathing, and I will, the last thing I will say about it is that it's as easy as ABC. You can all remember ABCs. Become aware. Be aware of if you're breathing, like I wasn't on the steering wheel, or how your breath feels. Two, breathe. The minute you focus on your breath, your breath will change. And three, control how you breathe or be calm. A, B, C. Be aware, breathe, and be calm. Okay, moving. There's a man by the name of Rick Hansen, um, whose work I like a great deal. And he has written a book called Just One Thing. And if we can just do one thing a day to help with our self-care. But he calls movement miracle grow for the body. And, um, and, that, and that the power of moving our bodies in whatever way works for that human being, and we're all different, and we do it in different ways, and we have different abilities, right? But the power of moving relieves muscle tension. It increases blood circulation, it gets more oxygen to our brains, and then we can think. Which, by the way, is why I've been having you do some movement, right? Even while you're right here in this chair. So now, just for a moment, take one hand and put it on the opposite arm of the chair. Mm -hmm. And take your other, I'm, I'm sitting in a chair, right? Okay. I'm going to take one hand, I'm going to put it on this side of the chair, and then I'm going to put my other hand on that side of the chair, too. And now, as best you can, look behind you. And then come on back. Do it one more time. Take in a breath. Twist around your spine. Look behind you. Sometimes we need to know what's going on behind us, right, in order to feel comfortable or safe. And come on back. Every time you twist around your spine, you're relieving tension all up and down your back. So twists are just a marvelous thing that, that we can do in order to move. Um, we move our bodies in six ways. So we move our bodies up. Just take a breath in. Stretch up a little bit. And as we did before, Move down, just float yourself down. This is a, and then come on back. When we come down like this, it's self-protective, but we also uh, eliminate a lot of the whoops world that's going on around us. Bring your hands up. Just gently move from one side to the other side, and then back again. Bring your hands down, twist one way gently, and twist the other way gently. You've just moved your body in six ways. And we do it naturally, don't we? We do it when we need to uh, re-energize ourselves. My point is we can do it intentionally. Okay. Am I, am I doing okay here? Yes, please feel free. I know you have things that you have to do in this world. All right. <clears throat> I gave you a handout, a couple of handouts. One is the handout of the three-part brain, so you can take that home and remember it. Another one is the story of why zebras don't get ulcers. Don't you love that? I know, I love that. I know, I know, I love that story. And he is very entertaining, by the way. So there, he has an hour lecture on why zebras don't get ulcers, if you're interested in that. Okay, and then there's another handout. It's called Calming Strategies for the Crazy World. Do you need a handout, Ray? No, or you can listen. I'll get you one. All right, so 
um, these are just one-liners. But maybe you'll connect with a couple of them. If you don't think you have a minute, take five. Just stop. If life is spinning, choose to stop. Just stop, take a breath. Using your breath is the quickest and best way to change your mood and your body. It steadies the mind and the body. I just, took, I just said mir uh, movement is miracle growth for your brain. That's Rick Hansen. I love that one. Okay, how about this one? A thought is just a thought. It may not even be true. There's a lovely book that's called A Thought is Just a Thought. Um, and particularly if you're thinking about things that, that make you anxious, we, a lot of times we have thoughts that are not true, right? Oh, it could be, um, nobody here is having any fun. This was stupid. Everybody thinks I, I'm too skinny or too fat or too whatever, right? Or, oh my gosh, my mind is just going <laughs> into the dumpster, right? I can't, I can't remember squat. Is that right? No, that's not right. I'm a bad parent. Really? You know? And, and this is something that, that I really worked a lot with, with teens who were anxious. But think about it as you go through your day. Thoughts are true. Our just just th goes crazy. OK. Things are not as they are, but things are as you are. Are you? Are you here in this moment? Are you, um, have you found ways that you can manage how you feel with all of the stuff that's going on in the world? What do you bring to the table? I love the way my brother says things when he says goodbye. He says, make it a good day, right? That's even different than have a good day. Make it. I love that one. Name it to tame it. What does that mean? Name it to tame it. Yes. If you put a name on it, you can control it. Um, I am worried, nervous, scared, angry, frustrated, annoyed. Uh, uh, overly excited, unavailable. In about 90 seconds of sitting with that emotion, oh, you know our crazy bird, it changes. And so the more we can name those emotions, and I happen to know that some people um, have a much, uh, a much more difficult time putting a name on those emotions. Maybe it's not the way they were raised. There's actually a term that's called alexithymia. A means not, lexi means word, thymia means mood. It's for people who don't have those words for their emotions. And that can be difficult. Neurons that fire together, wire together. Neurons. Neurons are all those billions of things that, that carry all the messages inside our body. What does that mean, neurons that fire together, wire together? It means we get better with practice, right? Practice gratitude. Practice gratitude morning and night. Calming strategies for our crazy world. 
Um, I have also given you some information about, that I'm not gonna talk about because I'm gonna stop now. Um, what's the other one? Hold on. Pardon me? Yeah, the power of showing up. This is uh, Dan Siegel. Thank you for that, Carolyn. This is uh, Dan Siegel's latest book. How can we help the children or the other people in our world, not just children, the power of showing up? So one of the things that Robert Sapolsky talks about in terms of stress management, yeah, become aware of your body and learn some skills. But he says the most important one is having a shoulder to cry on which is a social connection to get support when we need it, right? Okay, questions, comments, thoughts? Time to go to church? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And whoever else is out there, thank you. Okay.